Well, thank you very much. So, yeah, I should, I should really start opening with the question, what do you want if you have to give about three different talks within one and a half weeks? You want an email from Ian saying, can you give a talk about something that you have absolutely no slides about and make it a fourth one within one and a half weeks? So here I am. Um, I think officially I called this information models and ontologies. Um, I squeeze in data models as well. This is going to be really, really theoretical and dry. It is the perfect talk for just before lunch. And I apologize for that because I used to be an academic and I talked about this to students and essentially as soon as you enter information models and ontologies, that's when people usually start skipping your class. So I'm going to address today uh, what are data models, information models and ontologies, how can they be useful in the context of the IoT and why and how on earth is this related to Eclipse IoT, why is this man talking to us just so close to lunch? So, I think for most people it's irrelevant that there is a difference between data models and information models. In fact, you can subset them a little bit. Um, what's important for us is that you can use these models as a sort of language agnostic way to, descri to, de to describe con um, concepts in information technology. And, and my personal definition is that typically data models are slightly more technical and are easy, more easily understood, uh, whereas information models are more semantic. So a data model that probably every one of you knows, uh, here we have a sort of relational database. Table number one has time, timestamp, sensor, temperature, and that sensor relates to essentially a second table, um, and in that table we could read about temperature and humidity, what the sensor does. So in that sense, the data model helps us to formalize, to describe our data. It doesn't say anything about the capabilities of our sensor, okay? This is really just a definition of how we can write this data to disk and read it later and probably retrieve some other information. So this is an information model. Here in that case, we define our DHT11 sensor. It has a couple of properties, like it's a sensor. Um, there's a sensor type, and in that case, it's like a physical sensor. Um, these are immutable annotations, so a temperature sensor doesn't automatically become a chemical sensor. It's always a physical sensor. But then there are a couple of properties that can change. For example, in that case, the temperature, and although the DHT doesn't have a sleep mode. I squeezed one in just for the sake of the argument. And then there would be functions in this information model. So what can I do with this, with this sensor? Well, I can read the temperature and there's a get function for it. And I can put it to sleep and there's another set function for it. So in a way, information models, if you're, if you're minded that way, could be described as concepts that are very much object oriented. So, ontologies. Now, this is really boring. <laughs> ontologies define the relationships between objects, okay? So, let's say we take our DHT11 and it might be annotated with indoor temperature sensor, okay? There might be a definition. An indoor temperature sensor is located inside building structures. It's sometimes used to control a boiler, another reference to the ontology, or a radiator. So, you will realize that here I don't really define anything else but just that it's sitting inside. The entire definition of what temperature sensing means is up here, and this term here, indoor temperature sensor, branches off from ambient temperature sensors, and they branch off from temperature sensors, and they are part of sensors, blah, blah, blah. So that's the structure of the ontology. Now ontologies are useful because you can do ontological reasoning. So, I've drawn here a couple of relationships that might be implicitly encoded in my ontology. So, for example, a temperature sensor is a sensor. An indoor temperature sensor is a temperature sensor. That temperature sensor positively regulates the boiler, which is part of a building control solution. You can then do 
inference. So this is what I have to specifically tell the computer. This is what it can infer. So some sensors indirectly positively regulate parts of building control solutions. I've talked about this before and people ask me, are you going to recap all your slides? And I said, no. So if you're really interested, uh, like, you know, just Google it, you're going to find it. So why information models? Of course, implementation is a matter of taste. You take the data sheet for DHT11, it's some five or six pages, mostly how to communicate with it over, over, the, over the interface. Um, and then SQL guy wrote some code that you might find here. We create a table with a daytime and a float. Um, Pearl Girl wrote some other code. Here in that case, we know that it seems to have a temperature somewhere, and then there is probably something which might read humidity. Now, is that an integer or a float? I don't know. And, well, you know, I just give you my MQTT topic, go figure what it means. So essentially, everyone here is providing an ad hoc solution, it's cherry-picked properties of my sensor, and it's not really convertible between each other. So code is possibly the worst source of information if you're communicating your device capabilities to somebody. So wouldn't it be nice if you could formalize this all? So some well-defined information model, a repository of models that you can reutilize, some translate to functionality that takes the information model and creates, for example, a Java object out of it, and then beautifully well-formatted and documented code. That would be the beauty, eh? And there's one thing that does it all. That's Eclipse Warto. So, essentially, a human expert describes a device using the Warto GUI. That's written into an information model. You can retrieve information models from the Eclipse Info Model repository. Then there's a Warto code generator. It reads those information models and writes out code for various use cases. For example, you could have Python for your web app and some Java for your Android app, or you could even have a Node-RED node. So, Vorto is very much done by, by Bosch um, with a couple of sort of like freelance contributors, but it's really a Bosch project. And you, would, you might ask, why are they doing this? And it's just, I think the message is very simple. What to minimize the development time? Because once you have your info model, you can very easily adapt the output for whatever you want to do with it. So Bosch work quite actively with their own cloud, but they also do ThingWorks. And with their solution, they can really provide adapters to both of these data platforms. So this is just a, a, a screen grab. Um, so that's the, the editor that you can use. And essentially, um, the, the water language is a, is a DSL and the editor really just helps you to, to get your, your thoughts in order and to produce a nicely structured info model. Here's an example. So here in that case they are defining a Philips Hue light um, and the Hue light has a, a property which is, which is switchable. Now in a different file you would then describe, well what does it mean to be switchable? Uh, in that case, there, it's like, there's an optional on as a boolean, and the operations you can do with something that's switchable is you can put it on, you can put it off, or you can toggle it. Now, the model repo is still pretty empty, and I've been assured that um, if you work for Bosch, you have access to essentially everything that is internet connected these days, uh, because they are actively using it in, in production. Um, whereas for the rest of us, of course, um, there are just a couple of examples in Eclipse at the moment, and it would be nice to see this grow over time. Um, so, I've been asked, what's the relationship between the Water DSL and OPC UA? So, uh, for those who don't know, OPC UA seems to be the, the, the fetish of German industry 4.0. Um, it's the format that everyone wants to describe their device capabilities, etc. Um, I think there are not competing standards, and it should, in theory, be possible to take any Vorto DSL info model and just rewrite it in an OPC UI format. So there are other Eclipse projects, um, and there are other projects actually tapping into the Eclipse Vorto ecosystem. And one that's definitely worth mentioning is here the Eclipse Smart Home. 
And um, Kai Kreutzer, the, the main pair of hands behind um, Eclipse Smart Home, has started thinking about how he could use Orto to manage the different devices that are part of a smart home solution, but also how he could do semantic reasoning. So if you have a thermostat, then you can infer that somebody might want to control a boiler, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know how far he's come with that. So to me as an outsider, it's not quite clear what's going to happen with Eclipse Smart Home because there are a lot of like, technical and philosophical challenges around building ontologies. Also, building ontologies is nothing you do just ad hoc and as a, as a sideline. Um, ontology development is, is hard to do it right, and it's a time, money, and team structure problem, essentially. But what makes me hopeful is that with Vorto, you can very easily just add an annotation field to your information model, and that annotation field would then reference to an ontology. So, effectively, whatever happens, the infrastructure, the technical one, is already there. So I want to, to finish really with, this, with a disclaimer. I have not contributed a single line of code to any of these projects. Um, and I feel especially honored that I can talk about them nevertheless. Um, it might be that, yes, it's because info models and ontologies are very dry and you won't find many people who enthusiastically talk about them. Uh, but I really would like to thank the water team for doing all the work. Um, and Kai and Michael Koster for discussions around ontologies and how we can get ontologies into the, the home theater. Thank you. Well, I, I certainly agree, but I, ha I also have to say, um, there has really been a, a step change in the way water does documentation. When I first put my hands on it uh, slightly over probably a year ago, um, the documentation provided was only really understandable for those people who directly contributed. And um, I've just had my last look yesterday and, and suddenly like, you know, everything is clear. So it's one of these projects that are worth revisiting because as the software improves, also the documentation improves, and it might enable you to do the things that you want to do with them. So the Vorto ontologies don't exist yet. So at the moment, there's just all talk about ontologies. I personally think it would be great to have a ontology project within Eclipse. Um, but I think this is already where we are opening the debate as to where should the ontology be stored should it be on? Should it be hosted on Eclipse? Should it be essentially device or platform independent? Um, who should have authority to model the ontology and, and, and all of that? Really? Oh, that I don't know. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Boris.